Michael Bigham. I am the Chief Quality Officer at Akron Children's Hospital, and I'm a pediatric ICU physician. I have the great pleasure of sitting with Dr. Michael Forbes and Dr. Eric Robinette tonight and have a chance to share our experience around the COVID-19 vaccine, COVID-19 illness in children, and most importantly, get a chance to answer some questions that we've been hearing commonly from families about the COVID-19 vaccine in children and specifically the newly approved COVID-19 vaccine in kids five to 11 years of age. And so I, um, I'm, I'm pleased to be able to, to, to have this conversation with Dr. Robinette and Dr. Forbes, Dr. Forbes bringing his inpatient experience, Dr. Robinette bringing his infectious disease experience. It sort of feels like these are, are the, the right two experts to have in the virtual room as we talk about this really important topic. Um, so I guess without further ado, maybe I'll ask first Dr. Forbes for you to introduce yourself. Uh, Dr. Forbes. Sure. Thank you, Dr. Begum. Um, again, I'm uh, Dr. Mike Forbes. I'm the interim chair of P the Department of Pediatrics here at Akron Children's, uh, and my training is in pediatric uh, critical care. Thank you, Dr. Forbes. How about Dr. Robinette? Thanks, Dr. Begum. Um, I'm Eric Robinette. I'm a pediatric infectious disease physician here at Akron Children's Hospital and I also run the medical part of our vaccine program for COVID. Yeah, thank you. Dr. Robinette and Dr. Forbes have both been uh, chest deep in the topic of vaccines really since uh, late 2020. So thanks for your, for your input. I think maybe before we really get into the questions, I do want to just offer that um, parents or caregivers who are looking to schedule a COVID-19 vaccine for their, for their child who's now maybe newly approved in that age five to 11 age group, uh, I would encourage you to visit the akronchildrens.org slash coronavirus website, or alternatively, if you already have an Akron Children's MyChart account, you can get onto that account, and we will have uh, opportunities open to get your child's vaccine. We really have learned a lot from our vaccine experience this year. And what we know is that we need a, a portfolio of options for families. And so we are, are committed as an organization to make sure the vaccine can be available, whether it be in your child's child school, whether it be available at our Akron or Boardman campuses, whether it be uh, available in, um, in your uh, pediatrician's office, your HF office, we really are trying to make sure we have options available, even urgent care, our Akron Children's Urgent Care sites will be carrying the vaccine. And so we really wanna make sure we have options available, but to be sure you get a spot uh, to get one of those vaccines, we encourage you to visit the akronchildrens.org slash coronavirus website or the MyChart account. And so let's get into what the, um, the viewers are really interested in, which is learning a little bit more about the vaccine. Uh, Dr. Robinette, again, being a, a student of of vaccines, maybe you can talk us through this newly approved vaccine, the dose, the nature of this vaccine and for kids five to 11. Dr. Robinette. Thanks, Dr. Bigham. So um, there's three vaccines that we're using in the United States. Um, there's the Pfizer, the Moderna, and the Johnson & Johnson. It is only the Pfizer vaccine that's approved for use in children under 18 years of age. And it is that, that same Pfizer vaccine that's been approved for use in children who are five to 11 years of age. Um, it is a different dose. So uh, when they were developed, when they were studying the vaccine for younger children, they tested several different doses and they picked the one that produced uh, the best immunity with the least side effects. Um, and so it's one third of the dose for children five to 11 compared to what we're giving to children um, 12 and up. Otherwise, it's, it's essentially the same vaccine. Uh, Dr. Robinette, is that um, uh, Pfizer vaccine a two, a two dose series? Yes, so just like what we're doing for for uh, folks that are 12 and up, it's a two dose uh, vaccine series that are given uh, 21 days apart. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I think probably one of the questions that's um, on the minds of many of our, our, our viewers or listeners is, um, well, what is the consequence uh, of COVID vaccine infection in kids, particularly is, is my five to 11 year old gonna end up in the hospital or even in Dr. Forbes, your ICU? Maybe Dr. Forbes, you can give some perspective about what you've seen over the last almost year and a half uh, related to COVID-19 in children and what that, um, 
what that might be for patients and families to think about. Sure, great question. You know, I think that early in the pandemic in the pre-vaccine era, uh, we were all geared up to see a lot of COVID, as everyone else did across the country. And when the alpha strain uh, hit, we really didn't see a terrific amount of uh, COVID disease. We were pre-vaccine, and so the, vac- the, the coronavirus then mutated, as we know, into this Delta variant, which is very different when it comes to pediatric disease. And so we did see much more COVID disease. What we did see as well in the early you know, pre-vaccine with the alpha variant was a fair amount of what we call uh, multiple inflammatory syndrome in children, where after the infection or s- sometimes during the infection, the child's immune system is activated uh, and can make that child critically ill and, and put them in a, in a really bad way. Now in this era with the vaccine era, we're seeing MISC still, uh, but we're also, we're, we're still, to, to our uh, to date, uh, really none of our MISC patients uh, have been vaccinated. And so it appears that being unvaccinated may also increase your risk for this multiple inflammatory syndrome in children, which isn't a direct COVID infection per se, as much as the vaccine, I'm sorry, the virus, the infection activates the child's immune system and makes them uh, can make them terribly ill. Yeah, great. Thanks, Dr. Forbes. I think um, and, and maybe Dr. Robinette, you can confirm, but uh, the data that I know, at least about our own local experience at Akron Children's Hospitals, we've not yet had a single patient admitted to the hospital who's been fully vaccinated. Uh, and that means whether they've been, uh, I'm sorry, admitted to the hospital with COVID-19 infection or with MISC. And so I, does, I do think that validates our experience for those kids that are 12 and older. Um, who have been vaccinated, there does seem to be a pretty consistent prevention of hospitalization and and of MISC, that post-COVID inflammatory response. And so uh, so I appreciate that perspective, uh, Dr. Forbes. Now, maybe let's think less about those kids who might end up in the hospital, but more about those kids who are get sick with COVID but don't end up in the hospital. And I think families are probably trying to make an assessment in their minds. What is the benefit of the vaccine. I think we've already talked about the benefit to preventing hospitalization, but what is the benefit of that vaccine versus what are the risks of side effects or this myocarditis thing that I hear about? Dr. Robinette, maybe you could give us your perspectives and sort of what the science has taught us about the risks and benefit assessment for the vaccine and maybe with a little specifics around myocarditis. Sure. So, um, you know, that's really the important question when we're deciding on uh, should we authorize or approve a vaccine, as well as should we uh, should we give a vaccine to an individual patient? It's if you think about it like a like a seesaw or a teeter totter. You know, we're we're weighting all of the benefits of the vaccine on one side, and we're weighting all the potential risks of the vaccine on the other side, and we're seeing which side weighs more. Is it more risk or is it more benefit? Right. So that's that's how we think about actually all medical interventions, but particularly vaccines. Um, we have very high standards for risk versus benefit, and so. Um, there's a rare complication of the mRNA-based vaccines, which includes the Pfizer vaccine that we're talking about called myocarditis, which is an inflammation of the heart muscle um, that occurs um, in some recipients of the vaccine. It appears to be more common in males. Um, it's also more common in people under the age of 35 and particularly under the age of 24. Um, and so one of the questions uh, that has come up with this pediatric vaccine is we we understand that Children are at decreased risk of serious COVID compared to um, compared to older, like say the elderly adults. So there is still a meaningful risk of complications from COVID. And so, uh, you know, is it still justified to give the vaccine with this possibility of myocarditis? And and the answer that we have for the 12 and ups is very clearly yes. Um, so the risks uh, of myocarditis, although real, are extremely rare. Um, and the risks of COVID are are more frequent uh, by several, um, 10 to 100 times more frequent than the risks of myocarditis. Um, so the question then comes, well, what about the 5 to 11-year-olds? And, you know, what we did, a, the, the, the study of this vaccine involved about 3,000 patients who received the vaccine um, and about 1,500 patients who got a placebo for comparison to the vaccine group, and none of the vaccine patients had an episode of myocarditis. So, so certainly uh, similar to what we've seen in the 12 to 18 year olds, it appears to be a quite rare side effect. 
Um, and we don't even yet know if it's a side effect on that age group, although it would not be surprising if it is still a rare side effect. Um, and um, if we assume that the rate of uh, myocarditis is the same as it is in the highest risk age group, so that's uh, boys age 16 to 18 years old, uh, in the 5 to 11 age group, we would still find that the risk of COVID is higher than the risk of myocarditis almost under almost every plausible condition that we that we analyze. Um, additionally, it's important to note that COVID itself causes myocarditis at a fairly high rate. MISC, uh, which Dr. Forbes talked about, causes myocarditis at a fairly high rate. And the prognosis, meaning the long-term outcomes for myocarditis caused by MISC and myocarditis caused by COVID, is significantly worse than the prognosis for the myocarditis caused by the vaccine. So even in those uh, unfortunate rare patients who do get vaccine myocarditis, it is significantly less dangerous than the, that caused by COVID infection or uh, that by caused by COVID infection. So overall, risk benefit, even in spite of the side effect, appears to be still strongly in favor of the vaccine being the safer of the two options. You're Dr. Bigham, you're muted. Thank you. I think that's very helpful information. Um, I think uh, I think most uh, most of our listeners are really doing that risk benefit equation as as we speak, and I think um, your your sort of description of that is helpful. Um, I, I think maybe shifting gears just a little bit when we think about not just COVID nineteen infections uh, in children, but also things like influenza infections. And I know we're coming into the influenza season, and I know that. Uh, we're hearing a lot about the importance, and we believe strongly in the value of the, the flu vaccine. Can you, uh, maybe Dr. Robinette, help us understand the the uh, consequence of a COVID-19 vaccine alongside of a flu vaccine? Is there any risk of getting those at the same time? Um, or should we just get the COVID-19 vaccine instead of the flu vaccine? Can you give your perspectives around that, Dr. Robinette? Yeah, so the short answer is the CDC says that it's perfectly fine to give both those vaccines together and really any combination of vaccines that need that a patient needs with the COVID vaccine. Okay. The the longer answer is there's really two things that you have to think about when you're giving two vaccines at the same time. One is does giving both vaccines increase the person's risk of side effects? So is it is it dangerous? And then the other question is, does it still work? Um and, and the reality is it's extreme both in both cases, it's extremely rare for two vaccines together to be more dangerous than than those vaccines given separately. And it's also extremely rare for two vaccines to interfere with each other. It only happens in very selected circumstances among the dozens of vaccines that we're aware of. And now we have we have excellent data for the first question for the COVID vaccine. So we have hundreds of thousands of people in the 12 and up age groups who have received combinations of any number of different vaccines with the COVID vaccine, and there's been no evidence of increased risk of adverse um, effects from that combination. So we have very, very good safety data in the 12 and ups. Uh, there's no reason to believe it would be any different in the 5 to 11s. Um, we uh, we have uh, less data on the, uh, on the, eff the effectiveness of the vaccine when given together, but there's Based on what we understand about how these vaccines work and how vaccines work in general, there's not very much plausible evidence to suggest that uh, they would interfere with each other. And we, what we found as uh, practically speaking is that the risk of people delaying their vaccinations to try to sync and time everything up perfectly, and then therefore getting an infection either with COVID or some other vaccine preventable disease while they're trying to get everything timed is much higher than the risk that these vaccines would uh, interfere with each other's effectiveness. Oh, great, thanks. Thank you, Dr. Robinette. I appreciate this. Uh, Dr. Forbes, maybe this next question you can help answer. I know um, just in the last several weeks, the, there has been an approval of a, quote, mixing and matching of different vaccines. Um, you know, maybe you got the Johnson & Johnson vaccine initially, and now you can get any of the other vaccines as a booster or a secondary um, or tertiary, a third vaccine potentially. Um, is that an option for these kids, five to 11 year old? I thought I might've heard Dr. Robinette mention that five to 11 year old vaccine is really, uh, Pfizer is the only one that's approved for young kids. So are, are, are we able to mix those doses for younger kids or is it just a, a single option for those five to 11? Yeah. 
That's a great question. I, I don't know the answer to that, actually. I, I think for the five to 11 year olds, I would have to ask Dr. Robinette. Perfect. Yeah, so the only vaccine approved for under 18 right now or authorized is the Pfizer vaccine. So that mixing and matching is really for adult patients. Um, for people who are curious about the mixing and matching, the CDC still prefers that you get vaccinated with the same vaccine that you got for your primary series. And the reason is because these are talking about adults, because we have data from thousands and thousands of patients on the booster effects when you get the same booster as your primary series. There was a, a, a small study where they tested every combination of booster and primary series, and every single one of them worked great. So based on that, I think they're reasonably confident that a mix and match strategy is also fine, um, but there's less data. So they're still preferring that you follow the normal schedule. Great, um, thank you. All right, now um, let's roll up our sleeves a little bit. And Dr. Robinette, this one might be, uh, might be for you. I am, I am hearing a lot in the, in the media and in hearing lots of conversation about the, the risk of a vaccine, uh, maybe weakening a child's immune system, perhaps, and maybe, maybe the natural infection would be better for a child's immune system than the vaccine. And maybe you can give your perspectives on maybe the history of vaccines and why, um, why that has been dispelled perhaps, and then maybe specific to the COVID-19 infection and vaccine. Sure, so uh, the human immune system is, is absolutely amazing um, at protecting us from illness. And it has uh, multiple ways that it can respond to infections, but the, the ultimate response that we, we get that is the most protective is when the immune system can remember the infection and the next time that that infection comes along, it's able to basically kill that infection off using antibodies uh, before that infection really can cause any, uh, any level of illness in the person, right? So that's lifelong immunity, and that's uh, typically mediated or that's, that's performed by these memory antibodies, okay? And so the magic of vaccination, the way that vaccination works is it's any time that you can uh, cause your body to produce memory antibodies without having the risks that come with getting the initial illness, okay? And, uh, and so what the COVID vaccines are is we looked at the antibody responses in, you know, we being the scientific community, looked at the antibody responses that people produce when they got COVID infection that were protecting them from subsequent COVID infection. And, and, and they created vaccines that cause you to produce those very specific antibodies uh, without um, the risks that come with a COVID infection. Um, and so there's really not um, like, uh, I don't like to think in terms of stronger or weaker responses. The natural infection um, is, is dangerous, but if, if you do well, which many people do, you, you do have pretty good protection against uh, reinfection. Um, similarly, the vaccine is less dangerous than the in, than the natural infection, and it produces a very similar um, uh, protection. It's the same kind of protection that you get from both. You get neutralizing antibodies to the COVID virus. We don't have um, great uh, data yet to know is one better than the other. They're both very good. Um, they both have occasional breakthrough infections, um, both with vaccine and with with natural. Um, and there is emerging evidence to show that people who've had uh, natural COVID are still benefiting from getting a dose of the vaccine in terms of having additional protection against reinfection. Um, so so the, the bottom line is, um, you know, vaccines, uh, vaccines are a good and safe way to produce immunity to infections, including COVID. Um, and there's no reason that we need to accept the risks that come with the with the natural infection in order to get protected. We can get protected without exposing ourselves to those risks. Yeah. Okay. Great. Well, thank you very much. I have I have a a quick question, then a slightly longer question, and then I think we'll wrap up. The quick question, Dr. Forbes, first balance of the information uh, as you know it, as a scientist, as a as a hard critic of the science, um, 
yet also as someone who's experienced with COVID um, in a hospital setting, if you had a child five to 11 years of age, uh, would you get them vaccinated? Wow, that's a great question. You know, the the short answer is yes. Um, and the reason is uh, we've had lots of experience with this. I think the science around vaccinating 12 kids, you know, patients who are 12 and above is, is extremely strong. We have billions of doses, literally billions of doses given, very few adverse events, lots and lots and lots of protection, and then many, many lives saved. Um, the experience this year with unvaccinated people filling our ICUs, backing up our emergency departments, and the loss of life and disability, I think, is very compelling that the vaccine has made a huge difference in this. And so the, the approach that the FDA has taken and the CDC and the scientists around us for 5 to 11 uh, gives me terrific confidence, a lower dose, uh, a lengthy enough study to look for anything that could possibly happen uh, with a terrific safety profile. And now we have an effective drug, uh, effective uh, vaccine against uh, COVID infection for kids 5 to 11. And, you know, honestly, going back to something that Dr. Robinette said, we have a long history of developing vaccines that prevent hospitalization and death in the, to the benefit of community health. So there's obviously a benefit individually to getting vaccinated, but I do want to put a plug in here for community health. I think getting control of the spread and being able to live our lives again without fear of, of uh, what we've seen in the last 20 months or so is very important. And so to be able to create what we've created in the vaccine era, which I, st I think of as a, a bubble of immunity around the, the kids 11 years of age and under, now we can take five to 11 year olds and once they're vaccinated, now they become part of that, that bubble of immunity. And so community health is elevated and, and I think it's, it's, a, it's a, just a terrific moment for us to be able to vaccinate kids who are five to 11 years old. Great, thank you, Dr. Forbes. Dr. Robinette, same question. Uh, knowing what you know, the risk-benefit analysis, if you had a child who was 5 to 11 years of age, would you vaccinate them? I would, Dr. Bigham, and, and I think my reasoning is similar to Dr. Forbes's. Um, you know, I think I feel very confident that we've that the scientific community has gone around, uh, gone about this vaccine development the right way. We've done we've 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 done the first things first, and the second thing second, and the third things third. We've done everything that we can every step of the way to minimize risk to the patients. We've done everything that we can along the way to learn from any risk that is left in the process. So we've done a very 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 good job of 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 following people who've gotten the vaccine in in the adult world as part of our vaccination campaign to understand that if there's risks that we weren't aware of uh, from the clinical trials. And I think this five to 11 authorization is the next step. So we've we've minimized the risk for five to 11 year olds to as low as we can make it with 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 reasonable, uh, reasonably designed, thoughtful, high quality science. And we're ready to take the next step, which is to start vaccinating five to 11 year olds and protecting them. I also feel very confident based on what I've seen over the past year, how careful the CDC and the FDA have been about following for adverse reactions that if there is uh, rare side effects in five to 11 year olds that we will detect them and find them and we'll be able to react appropriately to that as well. Yeah, great, Dr. Robinette, maybe to that point, I, I, I do remember um, as I've reviewed the full data and I remember a couple months ago that the FDA was holding and the CDC was holding that bar so high that they actually went back to Pfizer and said, we see your first 1500 patients that you tested the vaccine in. I want you to double that number just to make sure that risk of myocarditis or those other risks that might happen less commonly don't, don't sort of show themselves with, a, with just due to the fact that uh, you now have enrolled more, more patients. And, and I think you, you, you were pretty clear about the risks and benefits. And even when they doubled the number of patients in the Pfizer study, they still didn't see any um, any increased risk uh, to those patients. So that's a that's a great perspective to share. One final question, then I'll then I'll wrap this up. The final question, and maybe Dr. Robinette, I'll let you answer this. Is okay, uh, uh, maybe a really tall, uh, big for age eleven year old versus a really maybe petite or small or thin 
um, 12 year old are is does um, does the uh, weight or height or those things within a child affect which dose they should get or is it really based on their age? It's based on their age. Um, so you should get your child or you should get the dose that is recommended for the age that you are at the time that you get the dose. OK, and, and actually it's pretty cool how they studied this. So we know the 30 microgram, that's the adult dose, the older child dose, the over 12 year old dose. We know it works. We know it's safe. Um, and so they tested three different doses at the beginning of this trial. They tested 10, 20 and 30. Um, they found that the 30 microgram dose patients had a little bit more in, um, reactions right after the vaccine. Nothing serious, but felt a little bit less well, uh, more fever, that kind of thing. And so um, they decided to look at the 20 and the 10 um, doses, and they saw that the 20 was a little bit less reactions than the 30, and they saw the 10 was less reactions than the 20. Uh, which is a very powerful finding in science when you see that as the dose goes down, the reactions go down, or as the dose goes up, the reactions go up. That's very uh, useful information. Um, and they also looked at the antibody responses in the 20 and the 10s, and they saw that the antibody responses were exactly the same in both those groups. So they felt that the 10 microgram dose for children under 12 would give you the least side effects with an excellent antibody response. Um, and the trial uh, patients in the trial were all the way from five to 11. So they had children from every age tested and had good responses. Well, great. I, um, as I always do when I sit with Dr. Robinette and Dr. Forbes, I feel like I've learned more. I feel like I've gotten a little bit smarter. So thanks so much for your wisdom and your experience. And I, I do thank the families that have taken the time to submit via social media or other ways their questions. I. I really feel like our responsibility at the Children's Hospital is for the health of our community, but it's really for the health and wellness of the children that we serve. And so if we can help uh, satisfy any of these uncertainties, answer any of these questions, give, give our perspective. And I know I'm speaking for the three doctors of us that, that we, we aren't in the business of giving misinformation. We're in the business of giving perspective and assessment and experience and our uh, perspective and assessment experience, I think is pretty, pretty, uh, pretty neatly shared today. So um, maybe as a, uh, as a, as a close to today's conversation, I certainly want to thank Dr. Forbes and thanks, doc, thank Dr. Robinette. I also want to offer uh, just one more reminder for parents or caregivers who want to get their child signed up for a vaccine. Uh, for those five to 11 year olds, we're going to have lots of options available, and those are available on akronchildrens.org coronavirus slash coronavirus website or on uh, Akron Children's My Chart account. Um, that isn't to say we aren't going to continue to vaccinate those kids who are older than 12. We'll still do that. Uh, we're going to do that at urgent care sites. We're going to do that at your HIP or pediatrician office. We're going to do that at, um, at, at schools. We're going to have options for for kids to get vaccinated, but we do know that there'll be many of those five to 11 year olds who, who they or their, their families really want them to get vaccinated. So we're gonna have resources available to do that. So again, I appreciate the, the thoughtful conversation today and appreciate um, the listeners for sharing their questions and giving us the chance to share the Akron children's experience. Thanks again, have a, have a wonderful day. Thank you, Dr. Begum. Thanks.